My text today is James chapter 1. So I hope you brought a Bible. We're in James chapter 1. Make our way over there. Have you heard the expression, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship? Amen. You heard that expression? Yeah. Use that expression. I use it myself. Uh, yet I want to talk a little bit today about religion and relationship, because... We don't want to give folks the wrong idea. In trying to give them the right idea, we don't want to give them the wrong idea. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 26 says, If any man or woman among you seem to be religious, seems to be religious. See, the word religious is in the Bible. Amen. If they seem to be religious, the word means to be pious or to be devout. And bridleth not his tongue or her tongue. If they do not control what they say, they're not in control of their tongue, but their tongue dominates. But deceives his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Vain just means empty. Their religion is empty. It's worthless. Some versions translate, it's worthless. If they have no control over that little monster behind their teeth, Amen. then their religion, their religion is vain. It's the word religion. It's used again. If there's a vain religion, an empty religion, or worthless religion, it must mean there's also a worthy religion. A right religion. If there's a wrong one, there's got to be a right one, correct? Pure religion, verse 27, pure religion. Again, the word means piety, devotion, worship, faith, religion. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, you know, there are many who are very needy, and in, in biblical times, there were a lot of people dying for their faith. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Amen. Keep the faith from any kind of corruption, defilement. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. You know, the word religion, religious, used three times in just those two verses. Uh, it's only used, I think, six or seven times in the entire Bible. Paul uses it several times talking about the Jewish religion. He said uh, that he was brought up among the strictest sect of his religion. He, he uses it to refer to Judaism a few times. But, you know, the term religion itself or, or religious, religion, religious, has really gathered a rather negative uh, outlook toward, you know, by people. People think of religion and they think of it in a negative way. And it's gotten to where even we as Christians, followers of Christ, uh, disciples of the Lord, people will talk about, yeah, well, you know, I tried religion. And, uh, and, and, and we will say it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. And, and I say that myself. It's not about just being religious because we associate religious or religion with Tedious uh, rules, endless regulations, rituals that are just empty and devoid of real meaning. You know, when I pray for people or when I talk to people, if, I, if I'm telling them about the Lord, I, it's not like I want them to become religious. Right. Amen. Amen. 
because you can go to any big cathedral edifice and, and, uh, and observe a religious practice. I mean, you can go there every single week. And it's like some people say, oh, I tried the religion route. You know, I did that. And I didn't really get anything out of it. <laughs> and so in order to correct that kind of thinking, we, we will say, well, it's not just about becoming religious. Amen. It's about having a relationship with the God who created the universe, Amen. Christ who died on a cross for your sins. Uh, it's not religion. It's a relationship. Amen. So <laughs> I, I, can understand, I can understand why we use the term. But I have also had to consider that we might be giving people not the whole idea when we say it's not about religion. Because I want you to remember, we live in a society where people make up their own religion as they go. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we say it's not really about religion, are we saying then it's not about uh, being part of a church fellowship. See, this is what people automatically think. It's not about religion. Well, then you can just, you can just uh, pray to the great spirit in the sky. Should we be saying it's not really about religion? It's more about a relationship. Well, the answer is, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> it depends on what your idea or what your definition of religion is. Amen. If your definition of religion is just uh, uh, watching or observing some ritual, it's certainly not about religion. But I want, you, I want you to know that the definition of religion, a good definition of religion, is hard to find. Amen. It really is hard to find. You look up uh, in the dictionary, you look online, and they give you the weirdest definitions of religion. Let me give you a couple of them. Some of them were pretty good. I tried to copy the best of them. Religion is a fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a group of people. These set of beliefs concern the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe and involve devotional and ritual observances. They often also contain a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. That's not a bad definition. Uh, you know, there are... You know how many religions there are in the world? According to uh, Wikipedia, for whatever that's worth, 4,200 religions in the world. We think of the major religions, you know, Christianity. Christianity is, is considered to be the biggest on the face of the earth, followed by Islam, and then uh, probably, probably Hinduism, then, then Buddhism, and then you get into some of the lesser religions where there's lesser numbers, you know, you, you, you Judaism and, and some of the offshoots of Buddhism and so forth. But 4,200 religions, that's, maybe we ought to know what religion means. Here's, here's another one. Religion usually has to do with man's relationship to the unseen world, to the world, to the world of spirits, demons, and gods. A second element common to all religions is the term salvation. All religions seek to help man find meaning in a universe which all too often appears to be hostile to his interest. This is probably the best definition I found. Religion is a specific set of beliefs about God and the practices those beliefs require. Specific beliefs are a part of the Christian religion about right and wrong behavior, heaven and hell, God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Bible. Here's what the basic thing is, I guess, that I'm trying to say. Christianity is, in fact, a religion. It is a religion. 
So we, when we talk to people, we want them to become Christians. Not just religious or not just have some vague notion of a belief in God or think they have a relationship with a God they really don't know. We want them to become Christians, which means they become part of a religious body and they adhere to specific beliefs about God. Not just some vague notion about God, but specific beliefs. Hello. Amen. That's, I mean, we, we have specific, very specific beliefs about God, about Jesus Christ, about the Holy Spirit, about the Bible, right. about angels and demons and and right behavior, wrong behavior. Amen. That's right. That's right. You might be surprised to know that God doesn't hate religion. No, he hates false religion. That's what he hates. He hates false religion. He hates idolatry. He, we see that throughout the Old Testament where the Jews would sneak all the idols of the heathen world into their religious practices Psalms 119 verse 104 says, I hate every false way. I hate every false way. There is a true way. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way, the true way, the one way, the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And in Psalms 119 verse 104, I hate every false way. God has no love for false religion Amen. because they are destroying men's lives and souls. God has no love for falsehood, for false religion, false religious practices. That's, you read the Old Testament, you see God's intolerance towards false religion almost every book of the Bible. I mean, we could think of... Uh, just as an example, Elijah and the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18, where he makes uh, this little bargain with the prophets of Baal. He says, hey, you guys, let's, let's find out whose God is really God. So we'll have this little test. You take a bullock, I'll take a bullock. You cut yours up, put it on the altar, and then you start calling on your God to burn up that sacrifice, I'll do the same, and the God who answers by fire, let him be God. They said, we're up for that challenge. You familiar with uh, the results? I know, First Kings 18, it's a great passage. I love Elijah mocking the priests of Baal. Because you know, the Bible says they implored their deity all morning for him to send fire upon the sacrifice. No fire. All morning. All morning. So, yes, yeah, there's uh, all these prophets of Baal. And here's what Elijah said. You know, your God, he might be taking a nap. He said, you know, he's God. He's a God. So the idea being he's a God. He's got to be busy. Maybe he's tired. Maybe he's taking a nap. One version, actually several versions translate in there, maybe he went to the bathroom. Uh, or maybe he's on a trip. I mean, he's, you know, maybe he's traveling somewhere. So he's mocking them. And so they start cutting themselves. If they cut themselves, if they bleed, you know, surely ba Baal will hear. So they... They're cutting themselves to shreds. No, no answer. By the time the evening gets there, they are bloody pulp and there's no fire on the altar. And so Elijah, you know, you know the story. Yeah. Bottom line is Elijah prayed, God answered by fire. Yeah. And then, and then they killed all the prophets of Baal. You see, God has no love for false religion. Amen. He had no love then. He really has no love for false religion now. Amen. Although he does not advocate that we go out and slaughter 
the prophets of false religions. Instead, we pray for them. And we try to share the gospel with them to enlighten them because they are trapped in a world of darkness. But, you know, the point being, God hates every false way. He hates false religion. And you know what else he hates? He hates empty religion. Empty religion. Hypocritical religion, like the like the religion that was practiced so often in the Lord's day by the Pharisees who, 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 were, who were experts at pretending. Uh, he hates hypocritical religion. Amen. I think about Matthew chapter 6 when he was telling his disciples, talking to them, Sermon on the Mount about prayer, but he said, look, when you pray, don't, don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't pray like them. Amen. They pray just to be seen of men. And when you fast, when you fast, you don't fast like them. Don't fast like the hypocrites. And when you give, don't give like the hypocrites. So I, then you want to read his, the Lord's thoughts about hypocritical religion. You read a little bit in Matthew chapter 23 where the Lord says things like, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You pay tithe of anise and cumin. But you've, away, uh, you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faith. Amen. They want to tithe out of their spice rack. They're so fastidious. They're so scrupulous. But they're unjust, right. unmerciful. Amen. He says, uh, you know, you're hypocrites. You're blind guides. He said, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. He called them blind, blind guides, whitewashed tombs, snakes, vipers, hypocrites. In fact, he tells in Matthew 23, how are you going to escape the damnation of hell? No, he had no love for False religion, and he had no love for empty, hypocritical religion. But he did not hate religion. He actually, God actually founded two religions. Judaism in the Old Testament. You know, God founded Judaism. Amen. It made it separate and distinct from all other religions and all other peoples on the face of the earth. And then Christianity, the New Covenant that, uh, you know, Christianity has its root in Judaism, in the Old Testament. Amen. We, we have been, uh, as the Bible says, grafted in, Amen. grafted Amen. into the olive tree. But. Amen. So here's my point. Not all religion is bad. When you talk about, well, it's not about religion, it actually... There's two kinds of religion. You want to keep that in mind. There's good religion and bad religion. So it is actually about Christianity. We don't want to give people the wrong idea that it's not about religion in, in maybe contributing to their thinking that uh, my association with Christians is not that important or with a church is not that important, when in fact it's vitally important. You follow you follow my, my train of thought here? Well, according to James 1 and verse 26 and 27, if there's any man among you who seems to be religious, you know, the proof, like the old folks said, the proof is in the pudding. You have to taste it to see if he bridles not his tongue. Now, you know, that's a very difficult animal to tame. Very difficult. Amen. Just when you think you've got it, he escapes. You think training a big dog is tough? Try taming the tongue. Keeping that under control. Keeping that thing quiet. If they bridle not their tongue, but they deceive their own heart. Because, you know, they, they're very proud of themselves that they just reamed you out with their, with their viper tongue. This man's religion 
This man's religion is empty. It's hollow. It's worthless. You know, this is strong language. Powerful language. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Keep himself unspotted from the world. There is truth in the fact that we can tell people it's not just about being religious. It's about a relationship. There is truth to that. But here's another fact that I'd like for us to consider. Uh, there's two kinds of relationships. It's about a relationship. Yes, but there's two kinds of relationship. There's good relationships and there's bad relationships. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, you know, here's what I was thinking this week. Because I heard somebody make this statement. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. And it made me think about this. Okay. Tell me then about your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about a relationship, correct? Then tell me about that relationship. Tell me what kind of relationship do you have to Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ. Tell me. I, I want to know. It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. Tell me about your relationship. Is it a good relationship? Are y'all close? Y'all talk? Y'all walk together? You walking in obedience to the Lord? Can I give you today just four qualities of a good relationship? That's, that's what I want to cover. Four qualities of a good relationship. The first one is this. You say you're having a relationship with the Lord. Okay. The four, four qualities. Number one, if you have a good relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, or if it's with, let's say it's with your spouse. We, want, we all want good relationships with our spouse. Amen. If you have a good relationship, a healthy relationship, number one, it is observable. I want you to turn with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read a verse over here. It is observable. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You all with me? Uh -huh. All right. Amen. We're going to read a verse or two. A very familiar verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Listen to this. Read it with me. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. <clears throat> Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. That's what it means. You're a new person. All things are passed away. The old life, all the old ways, passed away, gone, dead. Behold... Behold, what does that mean? Look, see, observe. Behold, all things are become new. Now, if you are in Christ, in a relationship with Christ, if you are in Christ, it is observable. Amen. You have a relationship with Christ, others see it, others know it. It's obvious. There's a change in your life. You are a new creation, not a patched up old guy, but a brand new creation. If you're in a good relationship with your, uh, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, you want to be with them. You're in a good relationship. You want to be with them. They, they're your favorite person in the whole world. You'd rather be with them than with anybody else. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's a good relationship. And you know... People can see that. It's not that you advertise it or put, put it on display. People just observe it. Amen. That y'all like to be together. 
you spend time together, you like each other's company, there is genuine affection, genuine affection for one another. You care. You care about the other. You care about your spouse. You care about their thoughts, their feelings, their desires. You don't want to hurt them. You don't want to cause them pain. You don't want to make them cry. You be the one who dries their tears, not the one who causes their tears. So when we say it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ, then tell me about that relationship. You, You like to spend time with the Lord? If you have a good relationship, then you would want to spend time with the Lord. You would want to worship and praise Him. You would want to be in the company of the saints. You would want to be in the fellowship of the church. You know, you would love what the Lord loves. You would love His people. He said He he loves the church. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loves the church. He loves the church. We should want to assemble with the saints. We should care about one another. We should care about the people the Lord cares about. I mean, really and truly, what is our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Okay, how's your relationship? Do you, do you think people who have a good relationship communicate? In fact, I don't think there's a, psychiatrist or psychologist on the earth who wouldn't tell you that healthy, open, honest communication is a key to any healthy relationship. If you have a relationship with someone, you're going to talk. You're You're going to talk. And then you know what you're going to do? You're going to listen. It's not just about talking, it's also about listening. It's about caring what they say, caring what they think. So, let's. how's your relationship with the Lord? We talk, we talk, but what kind of talking do we do? Is it just reciting certain memorized phrases, or is it genuine, open communication? Do you talk to the Lord from your heart? Do you think that there's merit in just repeating some memorized phrase or some memorized prayer, or, 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 or as some religions do, they don't even pray to the Lord himself. They pray to somebody else. Yeah, right. Pray to a saint, pray to Mary, pray to this one or that one, or pray to the big thing in the sky. Or They don't know what they're praying to. You know, some of the saddest things that, that you will see is people who are so devout in their prayers to the wrong address. Because the Lord said, when you pray, you pray, pray in this manner, in this manner, our Father. So, number one, prayer should be addressed to the Father. Pray to Father. And then you pray from your heart. It's okay to make your request known to the Lord, you know, because even in the prayer that's called the Lord's Prayer, there's a prayer for provision. Give us this day our daily bread. There's a prayer for forgiveness. There's praise, you know, hallowed be thy name and thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life. But I tell you, you know, if you travel to other countries, sometimes you see some things that are rather sad. Um. The prayers of, like, Buddhist prayers, especially when you get into to some, some forms of Buddhism. Uh, you know, the Tibetan, Tibetan prayers have their prayer wheels. You know what a prayer wheel is? Well, they, they have a little cylinder, and they will write their prayer. Usually it's a, it's a mantra, which is basically this Buddhist uh, thing about... Uh, well, if you follow the path, I guess it's Buddha's Eightfold Path, follow the path, you become 
uh, you become like Buddha. That's, that's, that's the mantra that they repeat over and over and over and over and over again. They, they write it, they stick it inside this little cylinder, and then they spin it. You can spin the cylinder because, you know, saying this thing over and over and over, it gets a little tiresome. After you've said it a hundred times, a thousand times, a bazillion times. So they put it in this little wheel, and you spin the wheel, and in, in, and in their theology, that's as good as saying the prayer. But spinning the wheel, you, spinning the cylinder, that gets kind of tiring too. So they figured, you know, if you put it out in the wind, and you get a little cup on it or something, the wind will turn it. Hey, prayers are being said. Now, you know what that is? That's religion. That's religion, but it's false. Uh, there was an outfit not long ago that was trying to collect money in California so that they could, they could build a thousand wind-powered prayer wheels to bring peace. Because, you know, you know it's going to bring such great peace but, upon the earth. But look. Prayer is when you talk to the Lord, and then you know you let him talk to you. Well, how does he talk to us? Well, you open the Bible. Because, you know, you know what the Bible is? The Word of God. It's God talking, God talking, God talking. Open his Word. Read it. You know he will apply it to you, to your life, your situation, your circumstance. He will comfort you. He might correct you. He might rebuke you. But open the word. And, and then let him speak to your heart. Because we speak to him, but it's not a one-way relationship let him let him speak to us as well okay let me tell you a second quality of a good relationship secondly is loyalty loyalty first it's observable second there's loyalty like in a marriage right from the beginning Lord said in Matthew 19, a man would leave his father and mother. He would cleave to his wife. Yeah. Cleave, it means to adhere to, to be joined to. He would cling to his wife. And those two would become one. They would become one flesh. Amen. And in a healthy relationship, they would be loyal to each other. Yeah. In virtually all marriage vows... You know, you forsake all others and you cling to this one. And it's for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and sickness and health, and until death. Uh, there is loyalty. And, and you know, you don't betray that trust. That's a trust that's never to be betrayed. Um, this is true with the Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to him. It's also true that we should be loyal to our friends, our brethren, those, those we love, those who trust us, those that we trust. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loveth at all times. A friend loves not just most of the time, some of the time, but at all times. So that means we don't stab each other in the back. We don't undermine each other. We, we want to not only encourage each other, but we want to build other people up in the sight of others right. and not tear them down in the sight of others. Amen. Remember what, Jesus, what Judas did to the Lord. He betrayed him. He stabbed him in the back. Yep. There are people who are disloyal, but you and I are called to be loyal. Amen. Loyal to the Lord, loyal to each other. Yes. And... I want to mention to us as well, you know, the Lord is always loyal to us. Even when we fail him, he doesn't fail us. He is loyal at all times. I want to read a verse to you. Deuteronomy 7, 9. I'm going to read this. 
He says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. He is the faithful God, ever loyal, never disloyal. He is faithful. He is loyal. Question is, are we? You see, in a healthy relationship, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. Well, you, are you loyal to the Lord in this relationship? Remember, he considers his disciples like his wife. The church is his bride. Are we loyal to our master, our savior, our Lord? Or are we like Israel often did? They played the harlot with the world. How about us? Are we halfway in the world being disloyal to our, our Lord? Or are we loyal? Uh, are we loyal most of the time? Who wants a wife that's loyal most of the time? You want a husband that's loyal most of the time? You want one who's loyal, period. Some years ago, we had a young man that was coming to the church. And I had to finally sit down and talk to him because his, his wife told me, you know, he doesn't come home until late, late at night. He gets off, you know, 4 or 5 o'clock, but he might not get home till 11, 12, 1 a.m., and uh, I said, well, where's he going? He, he's hanging out in a bar. So I talked to him about it. He said, oh, I'm just going there to have fun. I, just, I go there and hang with the guys, you know, the people I work with. We shoot pool. We throw darts, you know. Uh, I said, you know, you got a wife at home and a child. Right. And, and don't you think if you're in a loving relationship with them, you would want to be with them? I mean, you work all day. Don't you think you want, you want to go home and be with your spouse? Well, I just like to hang with the guys. And, you know, I told him no good can come from it. No good will come from this. If you don't amend your ways, go home. For one thing, the drinking, you know, the drinking is going to be a problem. It's going to lead to other things. First of all, you're going to be stupid. You're going to drive. That's problem enough. But besides that. All them ugly women that hang out in the bar, they're going to get more beautiful every drink you take. And before you know it, you're going to be in trouble. I could have been a prophet. Because that's exactly what happened. No, if you love someone, if you're in a healthy relationship, you want to be with them. And you don't want to be disloyal. And wouldn't you feel disloyal? I mean, if you weren't living right or acting right. God's always loyal to us. Always loyal. Um, and with that marriage vow, you know, the, the whole idea of loyalty, there is exclusivity. It's our relationship is exclusive. It, it, that means you can't be in a loving, intimate relationship with any other woman or man if you're married. And you certainly can't be in any kind of a relationship with a, a fallen, evil, wicked world. Because the Lord calls you to follow him and he wants all of you, not part of you, but all of you. An exclusive relationship is based on love, right. on love, and not just some romanticized notion. In fact, that's my third quality of a good relationship, love, love, not just, again, some romantic notion of love, but genuine, actual love. Amen. You love someone, you want to be with them, you want to spend time with them. And when you're around them, you're happy. Right. 
You ever see sour faces in church? This is a happy place. I've actually had people tell me that. Brother Rusty, this is my happy place. This is where I come. This is where I come, and, and I'm the happiest right here in the assembly of the saints. This is, this, you know, there are people who actually tell me that they look forward to being here. Imagine that. They look forward to being here. I've had them say, you know, I look forward to being, I look forward to this all week long. I've had people say it's the highlight of my week. Now, you know, they have to be a new creation because in their old life, they would have never thought such a thing. Going to church is the highlight of my week. They would have never thought that. And if, and if you told them that, they'd say, you are crazy. That's the highlight of your week. You want to wait. You can't wait to go be in church. Church is a chore. It's a drudgery. <laughs> I'm talking about to the old creation. When you're a new creation, it really is a place of refreshing and joy. and It is a happy place. Even when I leave, not as happy as when I came, because maybe the word was a little scolding or a, a little rough, but corrective, let's say. But you always leave, you always leave, or I pray you leave feeling touched by the Lord and refreshed by the Lord. The Lord is so good. A loving relationship. Not just where the old rituals are performed, but where there's meaning. And you know, I was thinking about those prayer wheels. I don't know why I keep thinking about that, but you know, there was an old Christian song years ago. My, my grandparents loved the Statler brothers. Y'all, y'all remember them? They sing a bunch of old gospel songs and, and they were very good. They loved the old quartets and they actually put a love for the old, the old gospel quartets in me. I still love that kind of music. I would drive my kids crazy in the car, you know, but I'd be listening to gospel quartets and they, they think that's ear torture, you know, but. <laughs> One of the old Statler Brothers songs, now they didn't write it, I don't, I don't really know who wrote it, but who wrote it, but it was an old song about uh, uh, just a little talk with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Then a little light from heaven filled my soul. Now you've got to say, filled my soul. <laughs> he bathed my heart in love, and he wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. He will tell them all about our troubles. You will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer wheel turning. <laughs> Did you know that that was in a gospel song? No. I mean, when you, you will feel a little prayer wheel turning. You'll know a little fire is burning. You'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Wait, what they doing with Buddhism in a Christian song? I sang it for years before I thought about that. I didn't know what a prayer wheel was. It, I mean, you really do have to listen to what you sing. And I, I think that's important today, too. And, uh, you know, the Christian songs that we sing and just just make sure we're not swinging prayer wheels around. And stuff. <laughs> I want one last quality of of a, a healthy relationship. And that is that it's enduring. 
a healthy relationship is enduring. I, I, want, I want you to look one last passage with me, and that's 1 Corinthians 13. We're familiar, I know, with 1 Corinthians 13. I just want to read a few verses over here. This great passage on love, beginning in verse 4. Let me, I'm going to read this in the New King James Version. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4. Love suffers long. Love puts up with a whole lot. That's the idea. Love suffers long and is irritated. No, it says love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Verse 5, love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own way. Love is not provoked. The idea here is it's not short-fused. It doesn't have a you know, short temper. Love thinks no evil. It does not think the worst. Verse 6, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. And in verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. It never quits. It remains. It's... It's steadfast. Uh, Verse 13 says, Now abides faith, love, and hope, these three, but the greatest is love. Love endures. Love endures, verse 7 says. You know, we admire those, we honor those whose relationships endure. We have... I know a, a, a couple of couples in the church who've been married a long time. I think maybe Jimmy and Joy hold a record right now. Yeah, they do. How long have you been married, Joy? Seventy years. Seventy-two years. Seven zero. Seventy years this year. Praise God. What a what a blessing. You know, in seventy years. If they could tell you the things that they have gone through, the ups, the downs, the corners they've turned, the highs, the lows, the tears, the joys. And and love has endured the greatest test of all, which is time. The greatest test of all time. And remains intact. Love endures. Time, with all of its experiences, its emotions, its the good and bad, the difficult, the happy. And they, you know, I, I look at them and they do more than tolerate each other. They, they love each other. Because there are those whose marriage may be at last, but they can barely tolerate one another. And don't have... Not, not only do they not have kind words for each other, they just don't even speak to each other in some cases. You know. but, but here you see where the Bible tells us love endures. It endures. Like the old uh, Andre Crouch song, Through It All. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all. Through all the ups, downs. Sorrows, triumphs, tragedies, difficulties, losses, griefs, happy times, tough times, through it all. We trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a relationship. You see, love endures. Our love for the Lord is to endure, and I can tell you with absolute assurance, His love for you endures. His love for you does not fail. We sing. His love never fails. It never gives up. Never runs out. His love is unfailing. Thank you, Lord. That's, you know, that's actually what the Bible says. Lamentations chapter 3. 
Verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I like the way the, uh, the English Standard Version translates verse 22. Listen to how it translates it. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We sing that too. Lamentations 3.22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Steadfast love, unceasing love, God loves you on your good days and on your worst days. He loves you despite what you may feel. Despite, sometimes we have to, we, we can't just look at our circumstances and think, Lord, where are you? He loves you. No matter what you're going through, He loves you. And He hasn't forgotten you. His mercies endure forever. That's another psalm, Psalms 136. 26 verses in Psalms 136, and every single verse ends with the phrase, for His mercy endures forever. Or as one version says, His love never fails. His love never fails. Love endures. You know, when we say it's not just religion, it's a relationship, then let's check that relationship. Let's check our own relationship with the Lord. Let's check our communication with the Lord. Let's check our, our love. Is my love the kind of love it should be towards the Lord? Is it loyal? Am I faithful? Am I the man or woman of God that I'm called to be? And, and let's pray, Lord, let me, let, me, let me love like you love. Amen. Amen. Father, we do pray today that you would help us to live a life that, that reflects the quality of a, of a good relationship that we have with others and, Lord, most of all, with you. Lord, we do recognize the value of both belief, what we believe, and behavior, how we live our beliefs. And help us, Lord, in all of our behavior to be a good reflection on your name, on your character. Help us, Lord, not to be an embarrassment, we pray to you. Help us to love like you love. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. Praise God.